Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Domeyer, and i um, co-hosted here with uh, Travis McConaughey from Hanamil USA. Uh, we are uh, both been uh, with Hanamil for quite some time now, Travis, quite a bit longer than myself. I work primarily on the traditional fine art papers. And uh, so what we're going to be talking about or working on today, and I want to welcome everyone as you jump on in here, uh, we're going to be uh, discussing today uh, how paper is manufactured and made along with focus on our sustainable fibers and our Green Rooster initiative on the uh, substrates and materials that we like to use uh, at Hanamil uh, USA and in, uh, in Europe as well, uh, GmbH. So what I'd like to do is, um, again, Travis, how you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing good, Joe. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for joining us for this from Alaska, uh, a couple yeah. miles away. Yeah, yeah. I, I came up here for a visit to uh, two art supply stores, one in the Anchorage and the other in Cordova, Alaska, and spent uh, at least three full days just working in workshops and seminars, teaching people how paper, paper is manufactured. And uh, knowing this was on, I uh, found a nice quiet cabin and uh, here's where I am. <laughs> so back to Minnesota in uh, about a day or two. In any case, what I'd like to do is start the presentation here. Uh, it's gonna be a uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation and we'll start uh, right off here. I'll do a little share sc uh, screen sharing here. And Travis, how's that look? Good. All right. So uh, what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about the mill itself. And um, let's see if I can get a slide going forward here. And I'm gonna do a new share here. Go to this one. Travis, I think now it's got the, the slides on the, there you go. So where's, uh, where we start is in, uh, in uh, Dassel, Germany, is uh, the location of the mill. For those of you who have not known uh, with uh, two, two previous presentations, if you followed along, 1584 is when we started manufacturing paper at the same water source in Dassel, Germany. Um, the Solon Hills region, where we do our paper manufacturing is 100% totally off the grid. Travis, I'm not sure why my slide is not moving, but I'll do this instead. So uh, we're, we're totally off the grid and uh, this allows us to uh, work with uh, our energy sources. So our mill is we're run by 90% hydro 90 and uh, wind power and solar power uh, to operate and function on the mills. And there again, we're in a very large wildlife region called the Solon Hills area in uh, Germany. Green Rooster Initiative and Travis, you can pipe in here a little bit. I wanna, uh, we right now donate about 5% of our proceeds from any of our natural line papers that we sell. And those li natural line is gonna include the bamboo, the agave, uh, and now our new sugarcane paper and our hemp papers uh, to various wildlife organizations uh, throughout the world. Um, I, I, you had, uh, I think, elaborated on some of the other programs or other programs that we've done business with. Yeah, the Green Rooster uh, Initiative, we started in 2008 to help with uh, wildlife um, and, and uh, forest preserve type of areas in Germany. And we do donate 5% from everything from our natural line. Uh, we also sponsor uh, various programs on that as well, uh, which Bettina during her presentation could get into more. Uh, but one of them is Prince for Wildlife. Uh, which is done mostly in yeah. Europe. And then one was, uh, we just recently did was planting 6,000 new trees near the near the mill. Uh, and those programs are, are part of that. 
which helps to rebuild forest areas and to help you know protect wildlife and and their habitats. Well, and the the thing about the the, the one there at the mill. Um, is that I think a large portion of our employees and staff were part of that on Earth Day uh, doing that work as well. Yeah, they definitely were. Um, pictures of all of them doing that. So now we'll go on to about uh, paper and paper as a whole. Look at the word paper, and this is what my presentation for my tradition. Uh, again, traditional fine art. I'm the working with those artists who are painting on paper, drawing and sketching on paper. Iris uh, and uh, the the original uh, um, term for paper. The original term for paper uh, comes from the papyrus reeds, which you find on the left here. Those reeds are harvested in Egypt and then pound it out flat uh, to create almost a laminate style paper uh, between one layer and two layers and one layer and two layers. And they'll thicken them up and they'll actually soak those reeds even longer to create a darker texture or darker tone on those uh, uh, papers. But the paper that we know is actually different. It's not a laminated fiber or vegetable fiber. We've kept the name paper, even though we don't use papyrus anymore. Uh, and in China in, in 105 AD, we started seeing uh, paper being manufactured out of silk rags and, and cloth and cotton fabrics and cotton rags. And what they would do is create these frames with a screen in them and they put that fiber with water blended together and mix it. This particular screen that you're seeing here or visual that you're seeing here is actually from a Taiwanese paper factory in which they are making uh, decorative inclusions in their paper. But you can see they have in this big metal tray, they have two very large um, uh, screens in which when they lift those up out of the water, uh, you'll see paper. Uh, a paper forming, the washi screens. And then this is uh, even made today. There are manufacturing, this is it from a Japanese washi manufacturing. And so what they'll do with this is that large vat that this gentleman is working out of will shift and pull the paper left and right. Um, and you will uh, eventually get a sheet of fiber. It's actually got two frames on it that's hinged so that when it opens up, they will actually uh, have a sheet of paper and they'll lay them and set them out to dry. And believe it or not, this is still being done today. This, is, this image here is from a Taiwanese, again, uh, paper manufacturer. Um, and they'll do this in Japan, India, China, uh, and in, in many cases uh, um, in Africa right now. There's still paper commercially manufactured this way. Um, and a variety of different mills. So China kept it secret for quite a long time. So in 105 AD, when paper was first invented, um, it started taking the path along the Silk Road. So they, the uh, adventurers and explorers and exporters would be moving along the Silk Road. But what happened is during one of those, uh, those lovely uh, trips, <laughs> so let's call them lovely, is uh, one of the the wagon trains or the trains got uh, um, marauded by pirate. The prisoners in that uh, train were actually uh, Chinese paper makers. So these paper makers now resided in Syria and started making paper in Syria. And so the Western Middle East or the Western East uh, uh, started to actually produce paper on a more commercial basis uh, and selling papers and, and selling their wares. It was, it then eventually moved from Morocco to Spain, up into France, Germany, um, to where uh, almost, uh, you know, 700 years later, we've got or not. Again, it's a maturated vegetable fiber that's put in a large vat. It's, uh, this is a uh, Henry Fortinier who developed this, this this piece of equipment. We still produce on a Fortinier machine today. 
It's a lot different than what this one looks like, uh, of course. Um, so you start with a, a large vat of water on one side, it sprays out and moves across the system. And I'll show you an actual machine operating here shortly. So what I wanna do is actually discuss how paper or the materials that paper is made in. With, excuse me, we talked about the pure water. One of the nice things about uh, the Hanamil mill is we are required to put that water back in the same condition it was when we got it. The benefit is, is we actually take out any pesticides, herbicides, and or uh, farm waste when you are uh, uh, filtering our water and putting it back into what the, the river near us is called the Ilm River. Um, so that's our, our start of our water, pure water. You can drink right from the tap, so to speak, or right from the well uh, with this water. Cotton. We love using cotton. Cotton is a byproduct of the fabric industry. A little known fact about the cotton is we don't use that large puffy part of the cotton seed or plant that you see there uh, on top of that stack of paper. What we use is the mill itself, the cotton gin pulls out the seeds. And so these cotton seeds have fibers all around them. And those little fibers are the ones that are other paper, not just us, other cotton paper manufacturers are using to make cotton paper. We are, again, using a byproduct of another industry. The cotton seed itself, then uh, when the fibers are gone, will go back A, into the ground to be planted again, or B, they get uh, uh, rendered for cotton seed oil. Cotton is one of the, has been used for hundreds of years now, if not thousands of years now, to produce paper. And so I like to dem demonstrate here, put a quick diagram in your head about the idea of what cotton newspapers used to be or why cotton is different than say wood pulp papers. So a cotton paper is, uh, um, this is one from the 1860s, 1865, I believe, in which uh, it still maintains its color, its tone, its texture, uh, because the cotton fiber was very strong and uh, had very low acid content or pH, uh, is pH neutral. As we started uh, in the history of paper, we started to take our paper and use wood pulp. If you can see here, this is a 1940s uh, newspaper in which the yellowing and the tinting and all the discoloration has uh, uh, created problems, obviously, maybe not to the newspaper, but if you're using this for a photo or for a painting or something along those lines. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, what happens is, is in the 70s, we started creating lignin-free, uh, 70s and 80s, lignin-free wood pulp. Lignin is the binder of the wood pulp itself or the, the wood materials or maturated uh, material, but it's also the high acid content. So when that lignin is pulled out of the wood pulp, you're actually going to get a, a, a sustainable fiber that is going to last um, that 100 year lifespan that uh, we can expect from cotton. In the digital printing world, cotton it, it is, uh, reacts different than in my traditional painting world. If you're a painter, you love cotton because it flows very well with water when you're using your watercolor paints on it. Uh, in the digital world, I believe cotton and alpha cellulose, there might, there's very little because of the digital coatings that are, are put on it. See any color changes or uh, saturations uh, differences. Then we go into our other sustainable fibers. And this is something that we at Hunter Mill has been, have been focused on for the last uh, eight years. In fact, we started in 2008 making paper out of sustainable bamboo. So there are about 20 to 25 different regions in the world now that are making sustainable bamboo. And um, when you start looking at bamboo, three years, they cut it down, it grows right back. So there's no cultivating, no tractors, equipment being utilized to replant that uh, bamboo. And I know, Travis, you've got a few uh, uh, points to make about bamboo and its sustainability uh, to nature as well. Yeah, uh, bamboo in, in general is just a great plant. Um, it can grow up to a meter very, very quickly. 
you could chop it down and harvest it three to four times a year, really, if you're just cutting uh, a meter or two off of it. And it doesn't have a very deep root system, but the root system it has stops the, the soil from washing away in certain areas. So it's, it's grown and planted and doesn't need fertilizer uh, in order to stop uh, soil erosion. Plus it just grows so fast that you can chop it all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's also the, the one key factor is it's, it's carbon emissions absorption. When you boo and you think of all the grassy leaves that are on it uh, and the grassy fibers in it on it, it's absorbing that carbon and creating a cleaner air and cleaner environment. It's about 300 times more efficient than a, if we went back to the wood pulp, our wood pulp is either poplar trees or pine trees. So your, your uh, bamboo is about 300% more efficient than a pine tree uh, at, at uh, taking uh, carbon emissions out of the air. We make it in the digital or in the traditional side of the house, uh, we have bamboo mixed media, which is a heavier grammage, great for doing watercolor work, et cetera. Uh, or we have a bamboo sketch and uh, Travis uh, will focus, he, he's a digital guy, if uh, he has any comments on the digital side. Yeah, the, it, as Joe mentioned earlier. What are the formats that this comes in? I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. The formats that it comes in. Yeah, uh, as Joe had mentioned, this was our, our first of the natural line papers before the natural line was a line. Uh, on the digital side, it's a, a smooth paper with a premium inkjet coating uh, without optical brighteners. And you can get it eight and a half, 11, up to 17 by 22 in sheets, everything in between as well, uh, plus 17 inch rolls up to 50 inch rolls. Wow. Uh, and again, it's, it's 100% sustainable as the cotton that's in it is also recycled cotton from our own mill. Uh, that goes back into the paper. So we're using the sustainable bamboo plus the, the cotton content that's in there that makes it a little more soft and pliable because if it was just bamboo, it would be extremely rigid paper. Uh, is actually recycled from our own waste on the other cotton papers that we are making uh, at the same time. I didn't know that, that's great. Cool, cool. Our next uh, super fiber, my favorite. Agave. <laughs> Byproduct of the tequila industry. Uh, what happens with the agave fiber is uh, these, these plants are about four to six years to maturity. They cut them, all, all the stems off, uh, and the heart of the agave gets roasted and compressed and uh, distilled into uh, tequila. The fibers themselves on the plants are created into uh, what's known as sisal, and, and those leaves will contain actually some byproduct as well that's used in the health and beauty aid industry because it is a succulent. Um, the uh, nice thing about it is, is that sisal then can be made into a paper as well. We make it in a for the traditional side. Uh, trap something about yeah, the all, uh, above and beyond uh, just us getting. Uh, 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 above and beyond us getting tequila from the plant which is in itself an awesome feature uh there's again there's no pesticides needed in order to grow this and it's actually a rotation crop uh, you can harvest the agave plant i think up to five to six times before it goes goes away um and you have to oh, replant wow. But in between that, it, it's a rotation crop, meaning that there's actually rows of corn in certain areas that are grown between these agave plants in order to um, get the soil and put the nutrients back into the soil that the corn needs. Kind of like in my neck of the woods, we rotate soybeans and corn. Yeah. Uh, down in, in Mexico, Brazil, where the agave is mostly grown, uh, you'll, sometimes you'll see corn and agave in the same exact field. In so get that nitrogen back up, get the nitrogen back up to the surface of the soil. Interesting. Uh, so our 
but as I mentioned before, we make uh, the agave in a block form. So a block in the fine art world has glue on all four sides. So you paint it and the paper won't warp while you're painting it. And uh, we do uh, agave on the digital side of the house for sure. Yeah, uh, the, the digital agave is more of a textured sheet, um, which is a little bit brighter of a white than the bamboo. The bamboo was a natural white. Uh, it comes in the same standard sizes as well, eight and a half, 11 up to 17, 22. And then the 17 inch rolls up to a 50 inch roll. Uh, like I said, it's got a subtle texture to it. Uh, I'm a, a fan because it's not too overpowering in there, but it it is a great addition to the natural line. Yeah, the the, the agave is again, and it surprises people uh, when we say that oh, agave, we can make it into paper. Uh, the packaging supply world, uh, we've had requests at times from uh, uh, the packaging world for doing a variety of different uh, uh, tequila boxes, et cetera. I've had that request in the past. The next super fiber, and it really is, is hemp. I mean, when it comes down to it, hemp has been used for thousands of years as, as a paper product, as a rope product, as a twine product. It is oh, a thanks. pesticide free type product. It does a lot of everything, uh, and trick that you would. There are certain specific documents that uh, they've done uh, printing on. So, yeah, the the hemp is one of the oldest papers that you'll find. the The oldest surviving piece of paper that's been found was actually made out of hemp. Um, they've dated it back to, I believe, a couple hundred years BC. Um, in China, and it's been used in various industries, like Joe had said, with the ropes, also clothing, uh, oils, things like things of that nature. We actually, um, as a society globally, had made hemp paper up until around the the eighteen hundreds, when the wood industry really took over, yeah. uh, and and forced the hemp industry, for various reasons, to not be able to produce hemp paper anymore. Uh, for example, uh, initial drafts of the Declaration uh, were written on hemp. Initial drafts of the Constitution of the United States were written on hemp. Uh, George Washington actually had a hemp farm, not to be confused with really? marijuana, uh, an yeah. actual hemp farm so that he could produce it for uh, the shipping industry, meaning ropes for the, the sailing vessels and things like that. Uh, so it, it's been a, a big time good as joe called it super fiber for hundreds and hundreds of years um and then through prohibition we weren't allowed to really use the plant anymore even though that plant is far different than the plant that was actually prohibited yeah, yeah. Uh, but they grouped it all together as one and just recently we've been able to start manufacturing with it again uh, and like joe said it, it's no pesticides on this uh this one depending on the the location of where it's at, you can get three to four harvests a year out of it um, because it grows and matures about two and a half to three months apart. So you can get up to four, four harvests a year and they can grow up to uh, one to three meters tall for the hemp plants. Wow. Crazy. <laughs> so hemp for us uh, on the traditional side is a drawing and sketch paper. But then we also uh, produce it again on the digital side, and I believe uh, it's a little bit lighter weight paper, is it not, uh, Travis? No, it, it's a, a 290 as well. Uh, it's a very smooth, okay. well, not very smooth like our PhotoRec Ultra Smooth, but it's a, a very smooth paper, um, a lot like our, our PhotoRag, that type of smooth. And it, it is a optical, no optical brighteners at all but it is a relatively bright white for not having any optical yeah. brighteners. And the inkjet coating on it is um, extremely good for a matte paper. You get a very wide color gamut on it and a lot of detail, uh, which is one of the reasons we use that mountain shop for our, our corporate image because of all the details in that rock. Yeah, that's cool, yeah. Uh, so, and then our, our new fiber that uh, is brand new as of this year, sugarcane. 
Sugarcane gives us uh, the ability, again, of, of using a byproduct of another industry in the, in the sugarcane uh, world. What they are doing is literally compressing the moisture and the sugars out of that uh, stem or that stalk. The remaining is, is it's a Bagasi fiber is the term that's used for the Bagasi fiber. And I know Travis, you know a lot more about this than I do because we do not have this in a traditional fine art paper uh, at this point in time here uh, uh, at, at Hunter Mill. Yeah, the, the sugar cane was a, a digital paper uh, many years ago. Uh, right when I started actually, it was a digital paper. And we were not able to get the fibers anymore, so we had to discontinue it. Uh, but lately, we have found a new source for the, the Bagasse fiber. And so we've kind of uh, reinvented the sugarcane paper. It, it's not identical to what we had before. It's got a much different texture uh, than the, the previous sugarcane. And also a new, much newer and optimized inkjet coating. Uh, we had discontinued the sugarcane, and I think, 2012, so 10 years ago. So it had old, older inkjet technology. And since then we've come up with a lot of newer uh, receptive coatings for that. And that's what's yeah. on the, the newer papers. And the, the sugar cane, uh, like Joe had said, it gets compressed, all the sugar gets kind of squeezed out along with the, everything else in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. And then once the sugar is extracted, all that leftover goes into different industries. Uh, I didn't know this until recently, but some of the sugar cane uh, leftover goes into the textile industry as well. I've ah. never seen a sugar cane or Bagasse shirt before, but I will keep my eye out from now on. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm sure you'll, you'll find a pair of uh, uh, queen size bed sheets pretty soon out of Bagasse. <laughs> yeah, 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 probably super comfortable too. Yeah, um, super, super comfortable and, and very sweet. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and again, so, it's just one of these plants that grows like a weed. Um, like yeah. you go out there and a week yeah. later, it's it's a couple feet tall. Another couple weeks later, it's six, seven, eight feet tall. Um, and again, no you pesticides think of the, are really needed. Really, two of the fibers that we just talked about are grasses. So bamboo and uh, sugar cane are both a grass when it comes right down to it. And so just like a grass, they develop a root system that continues to expand and those rhizomes continue to expand. So it's always when you cut one down, there's going to be a multiple of uh, sprouts that come up from the root system that's in there. So it's very interesting. We need to find more grass to uh, make into paper. Uh, next will be lawn clippings. <laughs> so now what I want to do is start looking at um, a variety of, 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 again, when we get these fibers, we do not make linter sheets. We get our linters from uh, uh, the, the processing plants that take the fibers and create them into the, the, the fibers. But these linter sheets are nothing but material, maturated vegetable matter is basically uh, what it comes down to when you start thinking about the material that's being here, uh, put in here. So these linter sheets get loaded onto our, our friend uh, Big Blue here, the conveyor belt. And uh, that conveyor belt, it's pretty cool when you start looking at some of the stuff of, uh, of how paper is actually made now. So I'm going to switch over to some video here. And uh, these, imagine these uh, uh, linters coming up over the conveyor into a big cooker or slash uh, blender. So in this situation with that uh, blending, we're taking that and that's probably about a 50 to 50 mix between linter and water right now. And then what we'll do is that'll take it from this tank to a much larger tank where we'll add a lot more water. When we're actually done and ready to put it onto the, uh, the mill, we're looking at maybe 20% fiber content and the rest water. Uh, and the reason we do that, it, it disperses the fibers evenly so that you get a very consistent paper. This is also the point in which we will make adjustments to the chemistry of the paper. So all paper fibers that I'm aware of at Hunnam, uh, uh, Germany, we use uh, calcium. Calcium carbonate is not a whitener. It's a bufferer. 
So it's like chalk material that will literally encapsulate, surround that paper fiber with protection so that you do not get yellowing. Uh, if for some reason you, you framed it, you, heaven forbid you took a $10,000 photograph and put some full uh, inexpensive acid, uh, fully, full of acid mat board over the top of it. So if you take away that mat, you're gonna find a yellowness underneath. What calcium carbonate does is it, it avoids leaching from an acid material to an unacid, for a, a acid free archival material. Now, if we have coloration in, in many of my papers, we might have a gray paper or a, a, a bougra paper, which is a printmaking paper that has a lot of different uh, brighter tones and colors. This is also when we add the pigments. We add pigments, not dyes. Uh, we have to remember that these are vat uh, colored papers. So that way, when you tear the paper or you fold the paper, you're not going to get white showing through where those creases or where those tears are at. And then the last item we see over here is a product known as sizing. Sizing does, um, and I know it's a really exciting photo, that, that white powder there. It really comes down to what sizing is, is it slows the absorption of uh, water and moisture in the paper. It's more, again, a protectant of, of, from moisture, especially when it comes to the digital fine art print. Sizing can be made out of a variety of different materials. We manufacture our, pri our uh, sizing out of an AKD, or also known as a vegetable-based sizing. So our mill, since 1965, has been a vegan paper mill. The glues that we use in our paper manufacturing and our pads and boxes and paper, uh, uh, packaging, none of it contains animal byproducts. Uh, and this is rare when you consider that we've been doing this since 1965, desi designated by the German government. We make paper on two different types of machines at the mill. We have a Fortinier machine, which remember we saw that one from uh, 1706 or 1806, excuse me, uh, when the Industrial Revolution was taking place. This is a modern version. So this Ford near machine on the dead center here where you can see my cursor moving. Travis, can you actually see my cursor? I can. I love Good. <laughs> um, so we're... At this end of the mill is where that 80% mixture of water and 20% uh, fiber is coming out. It'll spread out amongst an actual, this, this is about a three inch deep pool of water where it will dissipate. And eventually the water starts to drain out of it and the paper fibers and the, the, the cotton fibers or the wood pulp fibers remain. So I'm gonna play this video and you'll get to watch it go through its process to where on this end, it starts as a liquid, basically, and ends up as a solid on the other end. By this point, a sheet of paper started. There's that much water that's been removed. The blue is the mat underneath, the white is the paper. And so right at the end of this roll, uh, at this machine, this at this point, this is a paper. It's already uh, bound together, woven together, and it's going to be rolling off that blue undersheet, or we call it, uh, uh, and it's going to roll onto what's known as a felt. And it goes through, on that felt, it goes through heated rollers as well. So you can see there's steam in the middle of that coming up through there. And that's actually the sheet of paper that you're seeing on a felt. So here we see the paper up high where my cursor is. And the felt is this, this more yellow off-white uh, piece of paper. Again, the felt is what's giving this paper its texture. If we want it super smooth, we heat up those, those steam rollers when it comes to the drying process and it almost irons the paper out to a super smoothness or we don't uh, superheat it, we just do a slow dry on it and it absorb or it, it reflects the uh, texture of that felt. Felt, uh, here's an example of a felt that's not on the machine. It's actually a felt belt.
almost a very large belt. So if we switch, let's say from a extra rough paper, like a William Turner to a uh, textures on that. In my back here, Travis, looks like I had a little unstableness there. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Float, float plane went by. <laughs> So we, the other piece of equipment that we use is a mold made machine. So that Fortinier machine that uh, we talked about is actually making paper at about 130 meters per minute. The mold made machine is making paper at a very slow 30 meters per minute. So when you think about that, uh, you have to understand that uh, why is it different? What's slow? Why, why, why? You'll see this at the end when I compare both machines and the weaving of this paper um, and how that goes through. So a mold made machine, uh, literally the uh, there's a cylinder underneath this head right here or just behind, this is the head box. And right in here is a cylinder. And that cylinder's sweeping through that large container of, of paper and pulp. And it's picking up the pulp pieces. And when it's coming up through, it's leaving the pulp laying on this felt right here that goes across the bar. Many folks ask questions about how's the watermark made or a variety. So just this is a great little example of a watermark. So what the watermark is, it's not us taking a piece of wet paper and stamping it. It's actually less paper being uh, applied to the screen or onto the felt as we're making that sheet of paper. So you're just, it's thinner paper. It's not a compressed uh, embossment in the paper itself. So on the left, you're seeing one of our, our uh, uh, watermarks on the sheet itself. On the right, this is actually on that mold made cylinder we talked about. When it's picking up that fiber, it, it'll leave that mark in the paper, that uh, reflection in the paper. Pay attention to this steel or this uh, brass bar that's there because this brass bar pays a, plays a big part in the next step of us making paper, especially when it comes to something like a deckled edge paper. So this is a fun, fun video to watch. I'm gonna put a cursor right here. You can see there's a scoring. So remember that brass bar we talked about. So with that brass bar, as this is moving along, one roller or one felt where you see the, uh, uh, the, the text there, when that felt is moving faster than the one behind it, it actually pulls the paper apart. So when you get a deckled edge on, let's say a big printmaking paper, uh, the folks at Smokestack are uh, going to be doing some stuff later uh, uh, this week on our copper plate paper. And copper plate paper is a great litho printing paper. And so it's gonna have four deckled edges. That's how we become a deckled edge machine. Travis, uh, you had mentioned something about mold made on the digital side of the business. My side, this is where our premium, premium watercolor and printmaking papers are manufactured as well as pastel papers. Yeah, oh, uh, on the digital side, we have some, some mold made papers as well. Uh, if I'm being honest, Joe, we stole them all from you. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and They've we been around hundreds used, of years. Yeah, and then we put an inkjet jet coating on it. Uh, but they're they're very unique in that the mold made machines. Uh, Joe explained how they work, but I, I didn't hear mention the way that the fibers lay down. Uh, there, mm -hmm. no two sheets or rolls are identical because those fibers are not as uniformed or as machined as the other machine that we make paper on. Uh, so in, in that case, it's, it's always got a nice texture to it, but everything is very unique to itself. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that the mold made papers are, are so popular just because of its nice textured feel and that you can get a unique image every single time that you print on it. And what were you saying that the William Turner yeah, the, the, I'm sorry, yes, the William Turner, the Albert Durer, and the German etching are, yeah. are the mold-made papers in the digital side. 
two of which for sure we stole from a traditional side. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the third one, I, I do believe we did as well. I'm pretty sure yeah. that we took the Albert Durr as well. It's just called something completely different over there. Yeah. I mean, so again, it allows someone who's maybe doing traditional and digital, if they want to do their, their traditional print work on a, a, a litho press or a large press, they can then take it from their top catch press, do a scan of it, and make multiple images of it on their inkjet computer um, or their inkjet printer, excuse me. Yeah, and the, the texture and image would look almost identical. Yes. From yeah. a viewing it just gives you a real good uh, duplication or replication of the, the surface papers. So just a, a description of what a deckled edge looks like here. Uh, again, it's more of that. This is as close as you can get to using a screen by hand um, uh, as you can get with paper. Now, what I like to show here is, again, there's a reason why this speed makes a difference. So this is actually the mill speed of the Fortinier machine. Um, and these, again, were, were taken uh, at, with the mill. These two machines run side by side. It's pretty impressive to sit on that pathway and know that you've got these two uh, pieces of history that are still pounding out paper uh, uh, every single day. So this one's going 130 meters per minute, the mold made machine, the slower one is going at a uh, um, 30 meters. What's the difference? Well, when that water is going along super fast, it's like if you took a bunch of toothpicks or threw a bunch of uh, lumber into a, a stream, they're gonna start following the flow of the stream. So with the Fortinier machine at that super fast speed, the paper fibers are actually lining up next to each other. Well, this makes a big difference, especially if you're doing heavy top coatings or a lot of moisture in that paper, um, you might get wrinkling and bowing effects with it. The mold made machine on the other hand is giving you a woven effect. So if, uh, if I go back to our, our printmaking papers and you're using a printmaking paper and you're soaking it uh, prior to pressing it, you want it, it, mold made paper is gonna be a much better paper because you're gonna get less stretching of the fibers. So when you're running through a press and you're on your third color, you darn well better have our copper plate paper because it's made to do um, multicolored uh, registrations on your traditional printing uh, opportunities. And same goes for the William Turner papers, the German etching paper and the Albert Durer papers, so. That concludes, I could, I could describe, okay, and at the end of the machine, it goes into a big roll. I'm, I don't have a, a whole lot of information about uh, the conversion because there's multiple, maybe 50 new machines or different machines that get utilized uh, when it comes to converting. If not more. <laughs> if not more, exactly. So uh, we could uh, um, uh, spend another three hours just covering each one of those, the spiral bound machine. Ooh. So uh, we go into now a, a little bit of uh, uh, Travis. Did you have any more to add uh, to the paper making process, to the sustainable fiber process, uh, et cetera? Uh, I, I don't have too much to add. Just to to just reiterate in general that I'm I'm personally extremely happy that we've expanded the natural line. I've been yeah. uh, pushing for it for the whole time I've been at Hanamil, so ten years. And it's come around and, and we're expanding it and uh, we will continue to expand it already. The, the two sales calls or the, the two accounts that I'm meeting here up in uh, Alaska, their primary purpose for buying from us in the last year and starting and opening new accounts was the natural line. So it is becoming very, very important uh, that we create sustainable fibers uh, and sustainable products and that we practice what we preach. Um, you know, that we might uh, try to use uh, recycled goods in our packaging or even uh, uh, sustainable fibers in our packaging, in our cellos, all those types of things, try to use products that are, are uh, less harmful to the environment. And thankfully we see that from the mills management of looking into it more into a, a, how do we become a much more sustainable uh, organization for the planet. Yeah, and I, I know that we're looking into new fibers um, to grow the, the natural line as well. Um, I, I 
can't get into all the different ones we've been looking at uh, quite yet, but I know that, that more things are coming in the near future. Okay. Well, I uh, apologize if there is anything with uh, the videos uh, and the, the internet connection that I had. Hopefully there was enough to, uh, again, I tend to get nerded out over uh, how paper is made and manufactured. And then if there's, there's no questions in the Q&A, we will we'll let Joe get back to hanging out in Alaska and visiting some people yeah. as well. Uh, but thank you for joining us, Joe. We really appreciate you taking the time from All right. a few thousand miles away. Yeah, hey, it's worth it. I'm just uh, a little bit nervous about the connection. I apologize. All right, I do have a question on, uh -huh. actually that popped in. Uh, primary difference between um, the bamboo and hen, and why would you use one versus the other? Um, from a, a digital printing perspective, um, I mean, the there's really no difference as far as archivability goes uh, at all. The bamboo and, and hemp papers are very similar in smoothness. However, the bamboo is more of a natural white, whereas the hemp is a brighter white. Um, so the reason that I would use one over the other is just if I had an image where I'd want it more of a natural white, like, a, I don't know, earth tones, uh, desert mountain type earth tones, I'd probably put it on a bamboo. Uh, whereas on the hemp, I might go uh, with more bright, vibrant colors where I wouldn't want that natural tone to kind of shine through, if that makes sense. Yeah, interesting, yeah. And on the, on the traditional side, uh, the, the, the difference really is going to be that the, the hemp tends to, on our traditional side of paper, hemp has more of a, a sketching and drawing paper texture and feel to it. And for the um, uh, bamboo, it's, it's actually a, a great mixed media paper in that it's got more of an eggshell finish to it. Okay. Are there, are there any more questions that we could answer for you? Um, if not, like I said, we'll, we'll let Joe get back to Alaska. Uh, you can always email anytime. Um, the, I have a question just and, and the sugar cane. I think that's actually going to referring to the bamboo hemp one that I, I had just done. Um, <laughs> The sugar cane is, uh, has a texture to it and is, is the same white point as the bamboo. So if I'm, I'm looking for um, an image that I want those natural tones to pop out, but I want some, a little more depth to it, the sugar cane would be a good one to use because it, it adds that depth with that subtle uh, texture to the paper. Um, just to put the natural line as we have it now into a, a little better and more specific of a perspective, the hemp and bamboo are smooth papers in the, in the line, whereas the agave and the sugarcane are the two textured papers that we have. The sugarcane and bamboo are natural white, whereas the agave and the hemp are the bright white. So you have a textured and a smooth and bright white and a textured and a smooth in the natural white. And depending on your image, that would, in, in my mind and for how I do printing, uh, help me to choose which of the four that I'd wanna use based on uh, texture and tone of the base paper itself, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, and all the all uh, of the specs are on our our website as well. All right, and um, now if if there is nothing else, there is we'll we'll let Joe get back. But if you all wanted to join uh, Eric Joseph and Veronica Cotter for the next presentation. 
for the the six steps to a perfect print uh i'm gonna watch as well because i i love watching eric do what he does um so i hope to see you all there and thank you so much for joining us joe go have fun and in alaska and say hi again if you if you want to see a real a real printing nerd watch eric joseph he knows what he's doing man he's really good yes, and yes does. i appreciate uh, i appreciate uh you folks staying uh being with us today take care all right thank you all bye-bye